that um, uh, this sublimation is, f for example, somebody may throw themselves into work or into sport, into physical activity. In some ways, this is seen as Freud as a, as a controlled release of um, maybe aggressive tendencies or sexual urges or, or, or whatever. So um, uh, sublimation is, even uh, Freud will agree, a, m a mild release and maybe not what the dominant part of the personality, the id, requires. Um, per uh, perhaps we'll move on to the third part, the superego. Um, this is something that develops with so socialization. It's not part of the, of the child when they are born. It is the parent figure, um, the, the preacher or the policeman inside your head. Well, for example, in toilet training, the, the id would just not even know it was urinating. The ego has a sense, I'd better urinate in a toilet because if I don't, the superego will come and punish me for doing that. It is, in fact, a crime uh, to, uh, for a grown-up to uh, urinate in the street, for instance. Exactly. The, the interesting thing about the superego is you would ask, how, do they, how does the superego punish? It punishes through guilt. Um, and this is why Freud argues that the superego is uh, inc compatible with religion, that um, religion fits with the superego, that civilization and religion is like a... A, a superstructure, a collective super superego, so that um, be what the superego does is give incredibly, impossibly high standards for you to live up to, and then when you fail in this, uh, then it punishes the ego with guilt, massive m uh, amounts of guilt. So the the ego, in Freudian terms, is constantly besieged and embattled from um, not just the id, not just the superego, but also reality because it has to deal with the reality of being a human being. Um, I think you, you explained that the ultimate reality that the ego fears more than anything else. It's a fearful world, isn't it? I mean, in, in Freud, Freud thinks that the best you can get out of life, really, is to be what he calls ordinarily unhappy, um, just to be constantly disappointed, constantly feeling pain and so forth. And, and what his clinical therapy was supposed to address was very serious unhappiness, you know, neurosis, people who simply couldn't get out of bed in the morning because they were so fearful of, of everything. Um, so the thing that's feared most of all is dissolution of the ego, death, isn't it? And, and the impossible task that the, the superego is addressing is the avoidance of death. I mean, that is completely impossible. But in, in some, going back to religion, the appeal of religion in Freudian terms is it appears to be a, the w a way the ego can defeat death by having an afterlife which is promised by religion. Is that...? But uh, Freud is scathing of this. I mean, he thinks it's a very effective sublimation, but, um, but ultimately he thinks that that's all it is. It, I it is a sublimation, it is a sop, really, for, for, for these needs. Freud sees the world as pain. Um, he sees... In, in general terms, he sees it in three types of sort of pain that we must experience as human beings. One is, is just uh, physical, everyday pain of us, uh, our bodies decaying, of being subject to disease and so on. This is something that he knew personally from his... Um, he, had, he had cancer of the mouth, which was incredibly painful. He had, you know, he lived with this pain every day. Second thing is just just life, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, the things that m just make, uh, make life very, very difficult. Um, and then the third thing, and this is the worst type of pain. This is excruciating. This is the one thing that Freud says makes it impossible to have any sort of happiness in your life, and that is other people. Uh, other people make this world hellish because coming into interaction with other people means that we come into we must deal with this loaded situation it we must address our needs and we must face uh, somebody who has needs themselves um, and this we may feel aggressive towards them we may feel sexual urges towards them and then so it is all about needs unfulfilled um and I'm, I'm thinking am i right in thinking that the main people who make people's lives hell are close relatives, especially siblings and, uh, and their parents. Um, and so one of the most famous uh, bits of uh, Freudian psychoanalytical 
thinking is the, the Oedipus conflict. So we'd, we'd better deal with that since we're doing Freud. Can, can you tell us? Yeah, I mean, the Oedipus conflict is, um, is almost a cliche at this stage. This is the idea. Um, and almost everybody knows this, even uh, people who've vaguely heard of Freud have heard of the Oedipus complex. This is essentially what it means is that you want to sleep with your mother and murder your father. It, um, it's it's, it's, a, it's very influential um, in, in literature, in the arts. It, typically, it, it's been used to analyse pieces of literature such as um, Hamlet. Hamlet, the uh, Oedipus complex is seen seen in Hamlet. The, there's a, the famous scene of him in his in, the, in his mother's bed, bedroom where they where they physically touch and and uh, Freud uh, said that this is this is classical sort of behaviour of a of a of a son with his mother. Um, I mean, it's. Um, in the trade, in the in the psychiatric trade, I mean, it's dismissed. Um, really, pe people think it is it, it is just sort of fantasy. But um, in literature, it is it has had a huge, huge effect. I think that's right. I mean, just this week, the big movie that's been released is "We Need to Talk About Kevin," which is exactly a, a Freudian sort of case book, really, of a child that is just endlessly cruel and monstrous towards his mother in order to punish her for not giving him enough attention, really. But on one simple level, I mean, this is quite commonsensical, isn't it, that, that children who are neglected by their parents uh, are, are going to turn out to be unhappy people. I mean, on one level, it just seems very commonsensical. And, and that's part of the critique, is it not, of Freud's method as, uh, of psychoanalysis, that it's essentially pseudoscience, starting with the problem that who psychoanalyzes a so psychoanalyst, which is something they tried to solve but found it was an infinite regress. So there were certain types of people who couldn't psychoanalyze other people and so forth. Then to the, the very limited clinical success of this, I mean, people who are unhappy have psychoanalysis, remain unhappy even after a decade of the treatment. So what kind of treatment is that? But I believe there are other intellectual and clinical critiques of Freud which you dealt with. Yeah, I mean, maybe before we get, maybe we should just say what the analysis uh, is. I right, mean, I do, yeah. no, no, no. Um, uh, it is one of those things where you sort of take it for granted because we've all seen the movies. We've the seen the talking cure. Everyone's heard of that. The talking cure. Yeah. Um, and the analysis of dreams. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, Freud, he said that he had access. He had discovered this 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 country and this this id, and he had found access to it. And how what the access was was through free association your analyst your therapist will talk to you and through um long conversations um your id will find a way to come to the surface and um say things that the therapist as an expert will be able to interpret and um and then be able to address these these issues for Freud, the key thing, though, was not was not uh, free association, was dreams. He described the dreams as the royal road to the unconscious, and then he thought that through the interpretation of dreams, then you could get access to the to um, to the unconscious, to the id. But uh, as you say, people who were looking at his work and his uh, uh, the clinical evidence that he gave for his ideas. People say that it's just it's just made up. He's just a charlatan. That some of the examples, the cases that he he, he uses, um, some of them didn't exist, and some of them have been fabricated. Um, and uh, and people, uh, the Freudian technique has been found to be not very effective. Well, as ever, time is uh, running against us. But um, in the lecture, you dealt with the political impact as well, um, and I. Th you put the proposition that Freud really was a, a, a man looking back to the 19th century, very sexually repressed, to use one of his own terms, where sex was a problem. It was a pathological problem, how to keep sex in its place and keep that monster inside. But some of his followers took, took a very different view. Um, I think you told us that in lecture. What was that? I mean, we only have a ver the most brief time to, to mention him, but I think it is, in the context of Freud, worth mentioning Wilhelm Reich. Wilhelm Reich was a, a follower of Freud, but then broke away from him <coughs> because he didn't agree with the pessimistic view that Freud took on the personality and, in particular, the, the role of sexuality. He thought that sexuality had, was a beneficial thing, that essentially was the best expression of ourselves. And far from repressing it, 
it was the free expression of sex and your sexuality would be beneficial to you as a personality and beneficial to society as a whole. So again, it was everything that Freud said, not repression, release this. And this, he, he, his phrase was, there is a policeman inside your head, he must be destroyed. Um, this fits, uh, fitted in very well into the 1960s counterculture. Um, but it feels good. Do it. That, that was one of their slogans, wasn't it? Exactly. And, uh, and uh, he was very influential, very, very interesting. But I think we're running out of time. OK, so on that note, we'll have to wrap it up. Brian, thanks very much for that quick canter through Sigmund Freud. We'll be back next week to canter through something else.